best EF lenses, how to get the best results out of your L glass, best beginner EF lenses. Come on, there has to be a camera in here somewhere. Hey there friends, Alex Laux here, and today I have a camera review for you. In fact, this camera, the Canon EF. Just don't get it confused with the current EF mount from Canon that has dominated the EOS line since its inception. The EF predates those. In fact, it comes from 1973, and it's a bit overshadowed, mainly because of the EF mount, and also because of its older brother, the Canon F1 which is also a brilliant camera, but the EF had a little bit of a trick up its sleeve. So let's get into the background. As a company, Canon has been around since 1933. Their first camera, the standard Canon, came out in 1936 and used Nikon lenses. It wasn't until 1940 that Canon opened up their own optical factory. And even when the world started moving on towards SLRs, Canon maintained a robust line of rangefinder cameras. Of course, the Nikon F changed everything. And in 1959, Canon released their own 35mm SLR, the Canoflex. The Canoflex featured the R mount, a breech lock bayonet lens mount system. Despite its limitations, the Canoflex line continued on until the final model, the RM, in 1962. Building on their success in 1964, Canon updated their breech lock the, to the FL mount. The first two models of that of the FL line were the FX and the FP. But the most notable camera from the FL mount was the Pelex. The Pelex provided full TTL metering. Despite its popularity, the FL mount still had some imperfections. The one thing it struggled with was open aperture TTL metering. For that, Canon released in 1971 the F1, which featured the final form of the breech lock bayonet lens system, the FD mount. But the F1 was still an all-manual camera, especially when it came to exposure. And Konica had already released the Shutter Priority Auto Reflex T, so Canon had to keep up. Using a copal square shutter and the F1 as a chassis, in 1973, Canon released the EF. Upon release, the EF carried a price tag of approximately $460 Canadian. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $3,500 today. Power came from a pair of mercury cells. You could only get it in black, and the prism was both fixed as was the focusing screen. The camera itself was short-lived with production ending in 1978, but the knowledge gained from the production of the camera allowed Canon to produce the A1, one of the first electronic SLRs on the market. But now that we have the background, let's take a closer look at the camera itself. And here it is, the Canon EF. You can clearly see the design lineage from the F1. However, it has that nice classic Canon and EF symbol on it. On the front, fairly simple. You have your self timer. Right here is your silver locking breech. And right here is your lens. I'm working with the 50mm f1.8 SC. Not as desirable as the 1.4 SSC, but still an excellent quality lens. The first thing you'll notice is along your aperture ring here, the A. This will set the camera into shutter priority mode. There's no need to adjust anything on the camera body itself. Up top, you have your standard shutter release and you have your shutter speed selector wheel. And the best part is because it juts out from the top of the actual camera body itself, it makes it very easy to adjust it when you're out in the field without having to change your view from the viewfinder to the top of the camera. The same unfortunately cannot be said about adjusting the aperture. You also have your rewind knob and that is mounted onto the film selector wheel and it's simply a pull up and adjust. We'll just leave it on 100. On the back, you have your viewfinder. You also have your metering mode either for normal or for flash metering. And you do have a standard hot shoe with a couple of contacts for Canon specific flashes. 
On the back, you also have your on-off switch to turn it on. Simply put it out here, and you'll notice that the film lever will pop out automatically. To turn it off is a two-step process. Off, close. On the bottom, these two compartments hold the two mercury cells that are necessary. You have your rewind release, standard tripod socket, and this red button here. This is your battery test light. So you press that, and up on the top, you have a red LED that lights up. You also have here on the side, a standard PC socket for mounting an external flash. But that's enough about the camera itself. Let's go out in the field and get shooting. Despite primarily shooting Nikon, the EF is a wonderful camera to work with and was easy enough for me to pick up as many of the common features and controls are all in the same place. It is truly a camera for the photographer. It's well balanced in the hand with a good weight, enough to know that the camera is there without being overly burdensome. Despite lacking the Canon quick load system, the camera is easy to load and doesn't require much fiddling. The camera features an on off switch. When you flip it up into the on position, it will pop the film advance lever out. Then when you switch it off, you'll need to manually put that lever back flush with the camera body. One of the best parts about working in the camera is the viewfinder. It's bright, clear, and despite not having a split prism, it's easy to focus. Although the best part is the amount of information being displayed. You have your full range of shutter speeds, including the one which you're selected along the bottom of the finder. On your right, a needle indicates which aperture the camera has selected when in shutter priority mode, or in manual mode, which aperture you need to set on the lens. And that's why one big problem, there's no way in the viewfinder to see what aperture you've selected on the lens. While metered manual is possible, it's still best to run it in semi-automatic mode. And to aid in running the camera in shutter priority mode, the speed selector is easily adjusted without needing to remove your eye from the finder. The dial juts out just a bit from the camera body, allowing you to easily move it with your index finger. The film advance has a decent throw and a quick return, although I found myself keeping my thumb on the winder and guiding it back. I don't know why I picked that up. Mounting and dismounting the lens can be troublesome if you're not used to the old style breech lock with the collar lock, but you don't have to go with those lenses. You can use the newer FDN lenses with the button release. When it comes to the lenses for the EF, you can use any lens from the FD library. And these are excellent lenses, well made with a great optical quality, and the focusing is smooth as butter. These early lenses bore close similarity to the older FL mount lenses, and you can use these lenses on the EF, but you have to stop them down to meter. Best to stick with actual FD or FDN lenses. The lenses feature a locking collar in the form of a silver ring at the back of the lens. The idea was to reduce the wear on the lens's delicate parts, and it shows as many original FD lenses are still in excellent condition. But what makes the FD mount even more impressive is that from the start, it was future-proof. You can run these lenses on any fully automatic auto exposure cameras like the A1 or AE1 program. If you're looking for period appropriate lenses, the old style with the locking collar is the best match. Canon produced prime lenses from 14 millimeters to 800 millimeters and a ton of zoom lenses. Probably some of the best choices for a quick and useful setup include a 24 or 28 millimeter f2.8 lens, a 50 millimeter f1.8 SC or the desirable f1.4 SSC. If you're looking for something longer, either the 100mm or 135mm lens. If you're a one and done photographer, a zoom lens is probably the better option. You do have fewer options for fixed aperture zooms, but a 35 to 70 millimeter f4 is probably the best option as a good all around kit lens. If you go with the new FD lenses or FDN, these lack that SC or SSC marking as all the FDN lenses have the desirable SSC coating. If you're the type of photographer who wants a little bit of automation in their FD mount system, but don't like the idea of a plastic SLR or are unwilling to pay the prices that AE1 programs are going for today, then I would definitely say give the EF a second look. It's all metal, reliable shutter, rock solid construction, and superb metering. Plus, it takes every FD lens under the sun. Pair it with an F1 and you have a great 35 millimeter professional setup. I know that if I was a primarily a Canon shooter, an EF would definitely be a camera in my kit. And I would even recommend it for a student just getting into 35mm photography. Of course, the downside is it does take mercury cells, which are hard to come by. You can put newer alkaline batteries in there, but you might have a bit of an exposure problem. Just shoot black and white film and you'll be fine. 
Let me know your experience with the EF or any FD mount system from Canon. What's your favorite body? Leave me a comment below. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing, hit that bell notification icon, and give me that thumbs up. Until next time, I'm Alex Louts. Get out there, stay safe, make something awesome.